Hey there, people. This is Paul Street. This is the Paul Street Report. It is Saturday, <coughs> September 21st, 2024. I wanted to um, finish up my stuff on revolution and communism, revolutionary communism. Uh, and I want to finish up my talks. Uh, I guess this will be number five, right? Revolution number five. Uh, with a um, discussion of uh, non and even anti revolutionary ways of thinking and acting that are sadly prevalent across much of what passes for a left uh, in the USA today. And I suppose uh, elsewhere, um, I might not be going into as much depth as I thought I was when I first started uh, putting this together, because I think I want people to read what I wrote about all of that more than I want them to hear me discuss it in detail. I'm going to have some links that I'm going to put in the show notes to this thing. But before I get into um, the left and all that, I do want to say a few things in connection with the latest evidence that our country, and this includes the dismal Weimar Democrats, um, has now for the third quadrennial bourgeois electoral candidate extravaganza in a row, given rise to a republic Nazi atop the nation's Reichmost party top the nation's Reichmost, I, I like to say Reichmost instead, instead of Rightmost, <clears throat> of the two major capitalist parties in the United States. There's a not so subtle departure uh, in Trump and his fascist running mate, J.D. Vance's targeting of Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio. A targeting that has led to the closure of schools in public bombings because of excuse me, that has led to the closing of schools and public buildings because of bomb threats and mass shooting threats. Uh, A targeting that has led to fascist militia, proud boys, marching in the streets of the town. Springfield, my friends, is a snapshot of what much of America is going to look like if and when our ruling class and its political system, including the dismal Dems, let Trump back in the White House, as may very well happen. It's a distinct possibility. If not, according to some folks I talk to, we're pretty smart, a likelihood. Think about that. Uh, The departure here is the targeting of not just so-called illegal immigrants, but now fully legal immigrants who are widely said to be contributing to the town's culture, community, and economy. Springfield, Ohio, that is. Well, that's one departure. Going from targeting so-called illegals to actual legal immigrants. And that targeting of legal, legal immigrants along with the vile accusation that these particularly dark-skinned, that is, because Haitian immigrants, are eating their white neighbors, pets and dogs, is a sign of the virulent racism white supremacism uh, that lurks behind the legalistic cloak of legal versus illegal people uh, and that lurks behind uh, what the Nazi scum Trump and Vance mean when they say real American. That real American is a white male who stands atop strict social hierarchies and oppression structures of race and gender, keeping brown and black skinned people um, under the whip and keeping their wives barefoot and pregnant and even consigning their mothers and mothers-in-law and their childless sisters and aunts to collateral child care and related domestic household duties until death. And they're willing to kill women in defense of the supposed holy right of the uh, unformed fetus. And we found out recently about the body count that the Trump fascist Dobbs decision has created through the abortion bans that have spread across a number of states in this country thanks to the uh, Christian fascist Trump Supreme Court. 
Um, speaking of departures, we've uh, known forever that Trump, like all good fascists, is um, anti-Semitic. But he recently went into new territory by basically saying that if he loses the next election, this is what he said, if I lose this election, this next election, despite all the support that I've given to Israel, it will be because of Jews, because the majority of Jewish Americans vote Democratic, because the majority of Jews vote for the party that he actually called the enemy. He actually got up at a Zionist Jewish event to, to announce that if he loses the election, it'll be the fault of Jews, because he said they vote 40% for him and 60% for Democrats. Actually, Jew, the Jewish vote is about 25% Republican and 75% Democrat, and that's for various reasons. He says, if I lose, it'll be because of you Jews, uh, because you voted for the enemy. Well, there's five terrible things going on here. One, he's over-identifying Jewishness with lockstep support for the genocidal, fascist, apartheid, occupation, ethnic cleansing state of Israel, which is absurd. Some of the leading uh, activists against uh, the genocide that Israel has been carrying out in Gaza since last October are young Jewish kids, okay? Two, he's homogenizing an entire ethnic group showing no sense of its own internal complexity and the fact that its historical voting behavior reflects a mixture of, consider, of considerations of which the defense of Israel is only one. I guess I'm almost repeating myself in my second point on my first point. All right, I suppose if I was doing this over again, I'd rewrite that. Um, and I, I'll repeat this. Some of the harshest critics of the state of Israel I've met over the last year are young Jewish college students. You know, this whole thing that if you're if you're for the Democrats, the enemy, instead of for me and my fascist party, that you're betraying Israel, it's kind of bizarre insofar as Biden and Harris have been strongly behind Israel as it is carried out a fascist, genocidal, ethnic cleansing in Gaza, and as it is now upping its vicious assault on the West Bank and engaging in a proto- vicious mass murderous war with uh, with with uh, Lebanon third in classic fascist fashion Trump is calling the other major capitalist imperialist party the Democrats he's calling them the enemy which is intimately related to his ridiculous and absurd uh, ongoing description of the Democratic Party as communist right capitalist Democratic Party is communist the enemy that's domestic war language what do you do with enemies? You crush them by any and all means necessary. You send them running for their lives, leaving the country. The enemy? And one thing that's just so ironic about this is that Trump has been claiming the two assassination attempts on him have been because of the extreme and volatile and provocative language of the Democrats. Their language has not, is nothing compared to this kind of shit. Fourth, he's setting Jewish people in general up for retribution after the election. And I'd say that's true whether or not he wins the election, but perhaps most especially if he doesn't. He's setting Jewish people up. Fifth, he's exhibiting a chilling connection to the classic 20th century fascism of Hitler and his gang by targeting the Third Reich's top ethno-cultural enemy by far, which was, of course, Jews who Hitler and his Nazi party damn near completely exterminated from Europe between 1941 and 1945. So there's that. Something else I wanted to say. I mean, that's, that's my current events. Um, I said last time in my last uh, video, I think it was, that I have long been tired of seeming clairvoyant and uh, being in a position to say I told you so about the electability and then the conduct of U.S. presidents. And this goes back from the messianic militarist of Bush 43 through the arch neoliberal imperialist Wall Street Barry Obama 44 to the fascist Trump 45 and even up to genocide Joe Biden 46. Uh, the main legitimate reason I think to say I or we told you so is not to lord it over others and say, look at me, I'm smart and you're dumb, though. That might be the case in, in uh, many situations. 
Um, but to suggest that we who saw all this shit happening, the horror of Bush 43, the horror of Obama 44, the horror of Trump 45, different types of horrors, because when you get into Trump, you're getting an actual fascist presidency, and the fascism enabling and encouraging and accommodating and conciliating and, and in, in, in the recklessly imperialist horror of Biden 46. Uh, the reason to say that we we called all of that uh, um, is to suggest that some of us might want to get the ear of people. We might want to be listened to and might want to be heard by as many people as humanly possible, because we do seem to know a thing or two about the core nature of this American society and power structure and political superstructure. And that's knowledge that is critical. Uh, to figure out how to overthrow a system that is actively canceling all prospects for a decent human future fairly soon in all possibility. And doing so in ways that I've been talking about here on the Paul Street Report for the last two years, really. And this reminds me, I've been defending the absurdly and revealingly left demonized revolutionary communist leader Bob Avakian here on this site, both in these last uh, four audios and more broadly generally. And of course, I take a hit for that too. It, it, it's when you do that on the left, you put yourself at a certain amount of uh, risk, I'd say, not fatal risk, but uh, of marginalization. Um, but I have to stay true to authentically to what I consider to be great thought an important thought relevant to uh, revolutionary uh, making of history. Um, and I want to here to note in uh, the further defense of Avakian that while I didn't know it at the time because I wasn't paying attention, Avakian properly diagnosed the Obama phenomena from its origins and he quite properly predicted the entire capitalist and imperialist and objectively white supremacist trajectory of the Obama presidency in his own way uh, every bit as much as I did at book length, uh, he did that in his own way and probably in a much more revolutionary way than I did well before Obama uh, became president. Um, and that ought to tell you something. I, you know, there, there, there's, <laughs> I used to be a historian and you know, everything's about, did you prove your case on the basis of the, the evidence from the archives that you went into about the past? But there's also another way of, of being borne out and it has to do with uh, the capacity to predict. And uh, an understanding of where things are going that, that gets validated later, after, not not past with dead people, but future with what happens with in, in real time. Um, and uh, Vakin also, by the way, started warning about the Christian fascism that has now taken full root in the Republican Party and become concentrated in Trump and Trumpism and now Trump Vance and in branches, whole branches of government, the speakership of the House, the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Bacon started talking about that Christian fascism and warning about it, starting back in the 1990s. He was seeing its fruition underway uh, well, damn near three decades ago. Let's say, yeah, about three decades ago. He started talking and writing about that as he reflected on the Newt Gingrich, Tom DeLay, and Ken Starr-led assault on the neoliberal presidency of Bill Clinton. And I really doubt that much, if anything, about the rise of the proto-fascist Tea Party and then the full-on uh, fascist Republican slash Republic fascist party since then. And anything or, or anything about the dismal and Weimar and Vichy-like response of the Democrats to that fascism. I doubt that any of that has been terribly surprising to Avakian, who's been warning about a specifically, distinctively American form of fascism for three decades now. <clears throat> now, where I left off last time when I was going into uh, uh, this issue of the left and how messed up it is and how low its sights are and how, how uh, screwed up its vision is, um, uh, I was going into how shocking, as it might seem to many liberals and socialists I know, that the communist, the communist-led desirable socialist revolution that I think is advanced by a vacian constitution for a new socialist republic of North America is not actually about equality, primarily. Don't get me wrong. Yes, the goal of the desirable socialist revolution, the DSR, 
is not actually equality. And this will shock some of you listening because the demand for equality is pervasive in the declarations of bourgeois and socialist politicos for as long as any of us can remember. It's just part of the language. Um, one of the of, uh, United States avowedly Marxist parties actually calls itself the Socialist Equality Party. They have equality actually in their name. This is where I meant to say, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Just as there will be considerably more democracy under the DSR, under the Desirable Socialist Revolution, than there could ever be under capitalism, just as socialist democracy will be far superior to bourgeois democracy, there will also be considerably, very considerably, more equality under the class rule of the proletariat than under the class rule of the bourgeoisie. But no, sorry, the goal of the DSR is communism. And under communism, equality really isn't an issue. Um, it, it's Communism isn't about leveling uh, and, and making everybody the same in terms of anything. You know, in terms of basic abilities, you can't make everybody the same. If anyone's ever played sports growing up like me, you know that very well. People are not equal. But it's not about leveling any more than it's about revenge or violence. Revolutionary communists don't get hung up on equality for two basic reasons. First, when everyone's needs broadly understood are met, which is would be the case under communism, it really won't matter to us that some folks use their abilities or perhaps their, their luck to garner a bit more than others. And again, let's be honest, people's abilities are not equal. Uh, their luck isn't equal. But it won't be a big fucking deal because if someone has more, it's not going to be at the expense of someone else when everyone's needs are met. Needs broadly understood, incidentally, not just material stuff, but emotional, spiritual, personal relationship, poetic, artistic needs. Second, and understanding uh, this presupposes the, I think, essential, necessary abandonment of ridiculous bourgeois concepts of human nature as inherently selfish and egoistic and competitive. Uh, um, a culture that has transcended the desire to exploit and oppress and dominate, and that also has l abolished the vicious incentive structure of accumulation of capital and profit won't hatch people determined to try and turn more into accumulations of wealth and power that will allow them to exploit and rule and dominate. We will and have created a new, and if you ask me, a more truly human nature. And I'm sorry if that sounds scary and totalitarian to liberals and progressives, anarchists and democratic socialists, but there's simply no scientific basis whatsoever for these old time John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Daniel Defoe, bourgeois concepts of human nature as inherently egoistic, selfish, competitive, rat race, violent, dominate, dominating, and exploitive. Um, I would actually be fairly brief on my heavily Revcom and Avakian influence critique of the different dysfunctional patterns of thought and conduct that I have witnessed, often very personally. Uh, up close and even as a participant over the majority of my uh, politically cognizant life. There's no substitute for reading and studying. And here I might recommend hard copy, not online. And I also recommend taking notes. Don't do like me and write essays in the margins and in the backs of your books if you want them to have any real resale value after you're dead, right? Um, and you know, here's a related point. I don't pretend to be anything remotely like a main source on revolutionary communism. It would really be lane crossing for me to pretend otherwise. I've spent most of my adult life uh, mired in the in the, the world of an overly Western and academic version of Marxism. I had a uh, over long uh, and retrospectively inauthentic dalliance with left anarchism and a much briefer careerist participation in merely liberal progressivism. And this is very different from Avakian and other leading Revcom uh, thinkers and activists like Raymond Lada, like Carl Dix, like Lenny Wolf, Andy Zeese, and Sarah Taylor, Annie Day, and many others. 
who have been going against the grain of uh, the nonsense that passes for a left these days by advancing, embodying real scientific Marxist revolutionary communist analysis and politics pretty much for most of their adult lives. Uh, to get the real shit on revolutionary communism, you have to go to two places, the books, essays, and talks of Avakian himself and the Revolutionary Communist Party's website, the RevCom website. And I will put up that website link and also that website's link to the Avakian's collective works. Uh, for a left-informed critique of the left, as I have both experienced it from within and examined it from without, please see these two pieces of mine that I'm going to link in the show notes. Paul Street, The Lame Left, 17 Afflictions, uh, which is uh, collects a number of Paul Street's reports from January through March of 2023. I'm waiting for a phone call that I'm not going to be able to take to stop making noise. I'll have to decline it right now so that it'll stop making noise. I'll call them back. Um, so I'm going to put I'm going to put up the link to the lame left 17 afflictions and then a second follow up piece called Revolution versus Revenge Reflections on Left Pathology which was a Paul Street report of uh, October 19th last year, so not even a year old. Uh, the second essay dealt with four further afflictions. So the first essay, 17 afflictions on the, on the, uh, on, on, um, on the left, um, and the second one, four together, 21. Uh, and I'll just name them for you, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to, I'm actually trying to get out of here pretty quick. Um, they are, one, sheepdogging left electoralism, parliamentary Cretinism and mass demoralization, too. So bourgeois electoral bullshit, basically. Two, ec economistic and trade unionist revisionism. This is obsession with, uh, with unions and, and labor and collective bargaining. Three, hyper-identitarian, wokester, call-out and cancel culture. Among other things, the obsession with the color of faces in high places as opposed to changing society and structures and institutions and the, um, and the call-out and cancel culture of just canceling people because of their race their ethnicity, particularly older white males who just don't have anything to say about anything. You know, it's just, it's absurd. It's just completely ridiculous. Uh, four, foundation dependence, meaning dependence on foundations. So far, I've done every one of these. Five, proletarian standpoint or class truth. Uh, this notion that uh, because you're in the working class, of course, no one, the left doesn't even understand what the working class is anymore on a, in a global sense, but that there's just this inherent purchase on special purchase on truth by virtue of being a proletarian. And it's just bullshit and it's complete nonsense. It, it's just as wrong as the notion that someone has a special purchase on truth on the basis of their experience as a gay person or as a black person or as a Hispanic person or as a woman or as a male or as a whatever. There's truth is truth. Science is science. Evidence is evidence. Thesis, evidence, conclusion. And it, it, it goes to the, this is a big problem on the left, thinking that the proletariat has some uh, particular special historical objectivity by virtue of they are, they are it's not true. Geopolitical campism, the Putin left, the pro Xi Jinping PRC left, uh, the pro Assad left, and on and on and on, the multipolarista multi left that thinks that the world would be great if it's more multipolar, even if it's still capitalist. And I might add also in there in a subset of that, the Zelensky left, which is way, way, way too into Ukraine. So that was number six. Number seven, the pink, brown, Trumpin left, which is intimately related to the notion that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, uh, as also is the Putin left and the China left and the North Korea left and all the rest of the different states that the Freedom Road Socialist Organization calls, even though they're not full-on socialist states that we should admire. You know, well, what it really comes down to, in my view, in a lot of cases, is the enemy of my enemy, my friend. Just because somebody is on the wrong side of the American empire, therefore I'm in their camp. It's childish. Uh, eight, the conspiratorial left. Uh, in retrospect, I probably don't need to deserve, I don't have to break that out separate because it's so embedded with the other ones. The libertarian left, anarchist left. Nine, people who say they're for revolutions but who are against the vanguard party would be necessary for a revolution and against the seizure and use and wielding in a transitional dictatorial fashion of state power to defeat counter-revolution. Four revolutions, but don't want to do the government stuff, the vanguard party stuff and the government party stuff that's required for a successful, desirable socialist revolution. The direct services left, the people who go out and think because they give food to, to people on Skid Row that that's radical. Uh, the localists left, the people who just say all we can focus on is local issues, it doesn't work, give me a fucking break. 
uh, any number of locales. Every locale is impinged upon by the world capitalist system, by their state governments, by the national government, the whole fucking thing. The single issue left, you think it's sufficient to just pick an issue, abortion rights, voting rights, uh, uh, you know, just fill in the blank transgender rights, which is uh, just opening yourself up to divide and conquer. The pathologically pacifist left, I'm not pro-violence when I say pathologically pacifist. I mean, all these folks who just, the, the minute you say we need a revolution, they, they think you're an advocate of violence and terror, you know, and then back off of everything because yes, when you engage in a revolutionary movement, there will be violent response and, there, and the issue of appropriate self-defense will certainly arise, but that's different than being a violence advocate. The academic and adem academicist left for whom, you know, Marx is a, uh, is a smart sociologist or a smart historian or smart, this is just sort of part of a, uh, I, I don't want to overdo my criticism of that because I developed Marxism out of a confrontation with Marx with a really ha at least half Marxist history department, some of whom were more really Marxist than just academics. And that does happen in higher ed. There's some wonderful people like that, but on the whole, um, we're talking about things that are much more uh, than academic, right? They're, they're activists. I mean, getting out of the seminar room and I, I can go on and on about the pessimist and fatalist left, folks who've given up. It's just ubiquitous on the left. The selfist left, the whole narrative that, well, I can't focus on, I'm, I'm, I believe in socialism, but I can't focus on issues outside of myself because I've got to get myself together first, which just sort of seems to be this permanent immersion in self. Um, I mean, I get it. People can take care of themselves and all that. I, I go on about that. Um, and the 17th thing I mentioned was reflexive disdain for and dismissal of the communist socialist revolutionary states of the 20th century. In my second essay, I added four more afflictions. Uh, 18, beliefs in God, supernatural force, destiny, and teleological laws of history, including this childish notion of that Marxism is about um, uh, the proletariat's supposedly inevitable historical mission to become the grave diggers of the bourgeoisie. Inevitableism. It's like the predestination. Bullshit. Uh, 19, Trotskyism, which I should have identified as generally Western, Euro, and very white, biased, neo-Menshevikism. And it's just an over-attachment to um, time-worn and now obsolete concepts of, of, of an of, um, incipient proletarian revolution just waiting for the right Trotskyists to come along in a rich country. Always in a rich country. That's where revolutions have to take place. So it becomes Menshevism in that it just sort of makes everything dependent on the advancement of the productive forces and poo-poos revolutions around um, the entire world. It makes everything always about the working class, 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 class. It becomes part of the proletarian fashion. 20, tailing the oppressed, the notion that it's our job to follow the lead of oppressed people in developing strategies for revolution, which is insane and never been borne out and just completely false. Um, um, something that Lenin and Mao were very critically, uh, w w spoke about very critically. Uh, tw then my last one, 21, inversion-oriented revengeism, which is intimately related to the uh, religious childishness of the notion that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And just leave, you know, it's, 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 this is very common. You see this in social media all the time, lefties putting up guillotines and talking about eat the rich. Forget tax the rich. Eat the rich, you know. Destroy the rich, you know. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta slaughter them. You know, we'll show them. You know, we'll, we'll get them back. It has nothing to do with revolution. You could kill all the rich people and redistribute all the wealth you want if you don't get rid of the capitalist system and replace it with a desirable socialist revolution, the dictatorship of the proletariat, and a new socialist society. You will simply grow a new capitalist class. You may well grow it from within your vanguard communist party if you, if you get that far as to make a socialist revolution. It doesn't matter how many of them you kill. It's not about killing them. It's about getting back. It's not about tipping things over and putting the new people on, putting new people on top and new people on the bottom. It has nothing to do with making a new society and creating a new world. And I can't dig into all the details on these 21 left affliction. That would take hours. Um, I just want to say a few things about my list and then I want to get out of here. One, there's a ton of overlap between these afflictions, all of which are carefully avoided. Each one of these afflictions is carefully avoided in a Vakian uh, thought and in the Revcom line and practice. I could talk for a long time about the many ways in which these tendencies, Venn diagram, 
and with each other and mutually reinforce each other. The lines connecting identity politics and single issue politics and bourgeois electoral politics and the tailing of the, the oppressed, the lines of all of those two foundation dependence, the dependence on bourgeois foundations are very clear. So are the lines connecting the sentimental proletarian class truth fetish to trade unionism, to left anarchism, to reformism, to neo-Menshevik Trotskyism, and religious Marxist tele teleological inevitable inevitabilism, um, and to tailing the oppressed. All those those lines are very clear. Those are all connected. I could go on, um, but I won't because I'll be speaking a language that sounds too alien unless and until you read the two pieces that I'm going to put up in the show notes of this video. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is that these critiques of what passes for the left are interwoven into much, if not most, of the political writing I've been doing here on the Paul Street Report for the last two years. I'm going to put just four uh, examples of that up in the show notes. Last but not least, I'm going to be away from Substack for a bit for two reasons. The first one is that I've had some health issues in my right leg that require me to take some time off from sitting and standing in front of computers, uh, standing better. Uh, it's nothing fatal uh, or close to that, but it's bad enough that I am uh, well advised to take a break for a bit. Um, it's not just about the physicality of writing. Uh, it's also about the overall mental and physical stress uh, of it all. And this is, of course, a very stressful time. Um, and I admit that my my previous pledges, and perhaps this one, uh, of staying away are going to be challenging for me because uh, we are uh, in a time that events are moving at a ridiculously fast and horrifying and disgusting pace and way. Uh, and it's very hard not to comment. You, you saw me right now just mess up the timing on this thing by having to, to, to get into Trump's latest uh, vulgar, horrific, fascist rhetoric. The, Second reason is that I need to carefully prepare some spoken presentations coming up next month, including an appearance for Chicago's uh, Lefty College of Complexes on October 4th, a presentation at San Diego State University on Wednesday, October 23rd, and possibly something yet to be fully arranged in Los Angeles on Saturday, October 26th. And my writers and listeners will not be surprised to hear that the topics of each talk will be the quadrennial electoral extravaganza of 24 and 25, how to think about this a clusterfuck of an election um, and its different possible aftermaths in ways that help advance the cause of a desirable socialist revolution, an actual revolution on the path to a whole new way of living, a world without exploitation and oppression of one part of humanity by another part of humanity in a world based on the principle from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. I will put up links to these talks and uh, probably also some of the text from those talks. My God, I've spoken here longer than I've ever spoken, but uh, that's okay. And by the way, I'm noticing that the transcripts of my talks are pretty good too. So if people don't have time to sit through and listen to all of me. It's pretty, the transcripts are okay. You can read them. They, uh, they're pretty true to what I say. These make some mistakes. And on that note, have a good afternoon. <laughs>